Some of you are wondering who I am, so I'll just give you a brief. Uh, my name is Jim Virtue. Uh, my wife and I have been coming to First Baptist Weston for about a year and a half, and we're glad to be here and be a part of the ministry. I'm going to speak this morning from 1 Kings chapter 17, if you want to turn there. 1 Kings chapter 17. Some of you used to read or maybe still read the comic section in the newspaper. Some of you never read a newspaper anymore. Um, some of the young people wonder what a newspaper is, I think. But in the comics years ago, there was a, a little comic strip, the Peanuts comic strip. And outside it was raining torrentially, and I mean it was just a real downpour. And Lucy asked the question, what if it floods the whole world? And Linus, who was the resident theologian, if you remember Peanuts, he said, that's impossible because Genesis 9 promises that God will never flood the earth again. Lucy is relieved by that statement and says, you've taken a great load off my mind. And Linus responds, sound theology has a way of doing that. So trust, hopefully, this morning as we look at this passage that we're going to look at some sound theology and take a load off your mind today. The problem today is how do we trust, who do we trust, when can we trust? I've titled my message, Learning to Trust God. In this day and age, trust is hard to come by. When we think about what's going on in the world, and you go to different churches, and uh, it's kind of like the church of Colossae. As Paul is writing there the book of Colossians, and he says, there are certain things that were going on in the church. False teachers had come in, and they were teaching the people that, yes, it's okay to trust God. It's okay to say you're saved by grace through faith, but... That's a dangerous conjunction that you have to be careful of. But you also need to do this, and you need to do this, and you need to do this. And if you listen to many preachers today, especially on television, they will tell you it takes more than just grace through faith. Well, that's not true. That's all it takes. You don't have to do this and this and this and this and this. The problem is we don't know who to trust. Somebody stands up in front of you to preach. Many of you don't know who I am. Do you trust me? You say, well, somebody must trust you or you wouldn't be up there. Okay, hopefully that you can trust me. But you know, so many times we look at people and because I'm standing up here, you say, well, yeah, I can trust what he says. Be careful. I'm reminded in the book of Acts of Paul when he went to the different churches and he would preach. There's a, uh, I forget the reference, I should have looked it up, but the church in Berea, the people in Berea, it says when they went home from church on Sunday afternoon, they searched the scriptures to find out if what they had heard that morning was true or not. Most of us, by the time we get home from church after lunch, we don't even remember what was preached, let alone search the scriptures to find out what it was true. Who do we trust? Who can we trust? In our news today, in our world today, we have all of these people who are not telling the truth. I mean, the headlines in the newspapers this last week, Brian Williams, NBC anchor, been not telling the truth for 11, 12 years. And now everybody's concerned. Well, how many other times didn't he tell us the truth? And who can we trust anymore? That's the issue. I, grew, I went to college in Missouri. In Missouri, it's known as the show me state. In other words, it's, they basically say, if you, in order for me to believe it, you have to show it to me. Well, some of us are that way. Remember Thomas? Thomas, after the resurrection, he missed one of the prayer meetings and Jesus showed up and all the other disciples were telling him about it and he said, I'll believe it when I can touch his nail prints in his hand. 
I won't believe it until I see it. So this morning, we're going to look at a man called Elijah. Elijah comes on a scene. We don't know a whole lot about him. And, you know, when things like that happen, we say, well, it was probably an angel or it must have been, you know, whatever. But James 5.17 says Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He was like you and I. He wasn't anything special. He was just a man with our nature. But God used him. So our sound theology for the day is you can trust God's Word. And we're going to look at it. Let me give you a little bit of background. First of all, let's look at Ahab. Ahab is the king at the time, the king of Israel. He's the eighth king of Israel after the kingdom was divided. You know, the kingdom was united. and We had Saul, we had David, we had Solomon. Then the kingdom separated into Israel and Judah. Israel had all these kings. Judah had all these kings. If you list all the kings of Israel, they were all bad kings. And I'll show you. Chapter 16, if you have your Bibles open. 1 Kings 16, verse 2. Uh, he's talking about Basha. He said, As much as I lifted you out of the dust and made you ruler over my people Israel, you have walked in the way of Jeroboam and have made my people Israel sin to provoke me to anger with their sins. This is God speaking. Verse 13, all the sins of Basha and the sins of, sins of Elah, his son, by which they had sinned and by which they had made Israel sin in provoking the Lord God of Israel to anger with their idols. Verse 19, because of the sins which he had committed in doing evil in the sight of the Lord, in walking in the way of Jeroboam and his sin, which he committed to make Israel sin. Verse 30, now Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And verse 33, Ahab made a gold wooden image. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. So he's number eight on the scene, and he is the worst one so far. He did more to provoke God to anger than all the others. Ahab's the king of Israel, God's chosen people. But what does Ahab do? He marries Jezebel, who's a Gentile. She came from the country of Sidon. He, his, her father was the king of Sidon, a Gentile country. And because she came from there, their gods were different than Israel's gods. She had worshipped the, the god Baal, and so she brought that with her. Ahab built an altar to Baal, and basically he worshipped Baal. Baal was known as the rain god. Keep that in mind. Now, let's look at the passage. I'm not going to read the whole chapter at one time. I'm going to break it up, and we're going to talk about different sections. 17, chapter, uh, chapter 17, verse 1. And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. So what do we know about Elijah? This is it, right here. We know he was fr from Gilead, and he was a Tishbite. That means he was in the, from the city of Tishbe. That doesn't tell us a whole lot. If you do further study of that particular region of Gilead, people from that area would be what we would call today hillbillies. So picture this. A hillbilly from Gilead, Tishbe, is now standing in front of the king of Israel. How in the world do he ever get there? We don't know, other than God put him there. So there he is, and what does he say? He said, I serve the living God of Israel. God had obviously prepared him. Did you know God never asks you to do something he doesn't prepare you to do? He's not going to say, I want you to do this, and you panic and say, I have no clue what to do. No, he always prepares you. He may not prepare you like you think you should be prepared, but he always prepares you in order to do it. So Elijah comes on the scene and he says, it's not going to rain, nor are you going to have any dew until I say so. 
And obviously he was not going to say so until God told him to say so. You say, well, that's a pretty drastic statement to make. Well, we need some background once again. Leviticus chapter 26, verses 18 and 19. It says, and after all this, God is speaking to the children of Israel. He says, if you do not obey me, that's a pretty clear statement there. If you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. I will break the pride of your power. I will make your heavens like iron and your earth like bronze. In other words, I'm going to stop the rain if you disobey me. Deuteronomy 11, 16 and 17 says, Take heed to yourselves, lest your heart be deceived. You turn aside and serve other gods and worship them, lest the Lord's anger be aroused against you. And he shut up the heavens so there be no rain and the land yield no produce. Deuteronomy 28, 23, and 24. And your heavens which are over your head shall be bronze, and the earth, shall be, uh, the earth which is under shall be iron. The Lord will change the rain of your land to powder and dust. Now, remember, who is Ab Ahab worshiping? Baal. Baal is the god of rain. And Elijah comes on the scene, and basically, in our vernacular, we would say, my God's better than your God. You've got the God of rain, but my God is going to stop the rain. Wow. You know, Scripture doesn't tell us everything we want to know. I have so many questions as I read through Scripture, and I said, why, why doesn't it tell us that? It doesn't tell us what Ahab's response was. We don't know. I mean, you know, you, you go through some passage of Scripture, and it gives us people's responses. It does not give us Ahab's response. We assume it was not a happy response. I mean, here's a guy standing in front of him, a hillbilly at that, standing in front of him saying, I know you worship the God of rain, but it's not going to rain until I say so. So we come to verse 2. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to him, that's Elijah. So now the Lord, once he's done his first duty, the word of the Lord comes to him saying, Get away from here, turn eastward, and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. And it will be that you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and stayed by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. So we see the word of the Lord came to Elijah. So remember our theme today, learning to trust God. Elijah trusted God. God's word came to him and said, go hide by the brook Cherith. Now why did he tell him to go hide? Well, if you talk to different theologians, you're going to get a whole lot of different opinions because everybody has their own opinion. Some people say, well, Ahab was going to out, is out to kill him, so you know, he, he needs to hide him. That possible, although I don't think Ahab will kill him before he says, let it rain. Uh, that's just a thought in my mind. Other people say the reason that God hid Elijah is he did not want the word of God being preached anymore during this time of drought. We know that we, when we have a whole lot of something, we don't appreciate it as much as when we don't have a whole lot of things. So God could have been creating a desire in the people's hearts for the Word of God. You know, in some parts of the world, they don't have Bibles. And there are some churches that would have one Bible or part of a Bible. And so what they do is, every time they come together, they trade pages. Everybody gets a page. 
And then next Sunday we come back and I have to give up my page and I get a new page. Knowing I'll probably never see that page again. And many people memorize key parts of that page because they know they'll never see it again. We have Bibles galore. I was sitting in my study reading through this again and studying and preparing and I thought, I wonder how many Bibles I have. So I looked up on my bookshelf and I counted 30 Bibles. I thought, that's a lot. And then I have three or four that I use all the time in study. And then I thought, most of you have probably 15 or 20 versions of the Bible on your phone. So we've got the Word of God very plentiful. Do we read it? That's just a thought, just a question. Do we trust God? Maybe that's why God was eliminating Elijah from preaching so that people would have a thirst for the Word of God. We don't know why. All we know is God said, Elijah, go hide by the brook Cherith. Elijah obeyed because he trusted God. We're going to look at Elijah's life in several stages here, and each time we're going to see he obeyed because he trusted God. God does that in our lives. Think about Philip for a minute. Philip in the book of Acts went up and preached in Samaria. Philip was having a great revival there, reaching many people with the gospel. And God came to him and said, Philip, I want you to leave and I want you to go down to the desert in Gaza. And Philip, I'm sure, thought, look at what's happening here. We're having revival break out. And you want me to leave to go to the desert? Well, God had a man in the desert he wanted Philip to minister to. That doesn't sound natural to us. But remember, God's logic is different than ours. His thoughts are above our thoughts. See, we don't, we're not to wonder why. We just need to be obedient, go where God tells us, when God tells us to go. So Elijah's obedient, crossed back over Jordan, went to the brook, and it says God took care of his needs. God promised him before he went. He says, I will have a brook there for you to get water from, and I will have the ravens feed you every morning and every night. Why ravens? I want to read you a verse from Leviticus chapter 11, verse 13. And it says, and these you shall regard as an abomination among the birds. They shall not be eaten. They are an abomination. The eagle, the vulture, the buzzard, the kite, the falcon, every raven after its kind. So the raven was considered an abomination for God's people. And yet God's going to use the raven to feed Elijah. Are you ever amazed at who God uses to do his ministry? I mean, if you'd have told me, uh, I guess my age really doesn't matter. If you'd have told me 50 years ago that I would be preaching, I would have said, you're crazy. Because 50 years ago, I was on a farm growing up milking cows every morning and every night. But God saw fit to call me. God calls people from all walks of life, all different kinds of people, to do his ministry. So he used the ravens. Now, this is interesting about ravens. By the way, I grew up on the farm. Ravens are very similar to crows. My dad hated crows because they were a nasty bird. And he would kill them regularly. If you lived on a farm, you didn't want them around. All right? Kind of like pigeons. But you know, Elijah didn't question ravens bringing him food. Here was an unclean animal bringing him food 
But God took care of him. Think about this about ravens. Ravens, typically, their natural instinct was they didn't even feed their babies. But God used them to feed Elijah every morning and every night, and he never missed a meal. We don't know how long he was there. It was obviously some period of time. We don't know how long, but God always provided. How, how about this question? There's a drought, no rain. Where did the ravens get the food? I don't know. God gave it to them somehow. We don't understand it all. But the key is we learn to trust God. So then the brook dries up. Now, I don't know what your personality is. I'm, my personality is I, I'm very structured, very organized, and all of that. And so I'm, I, I, if I was by the brook, if I was Elijah, I'm by the brook, and I see that the brook is slowly diminishing. It's not running as fast as it used to. The water is getting shallower and shallower. And I'm thinking, I'm going to run out of water. What am I going to do? Verse 7, the brook dried up. Verse 8, then the word of the Lord came to him. God didn't tell him what he was going to do until the brook was dry. See, we want to know what's God going to do next year. God says, don't worry about next year. I'll take care of next year. You just take care of today. Do what I'm asking you to do today. I will provide for you if you trust me. So starting in verse 8, then the word of the Lord came to him saying, so the brook's dried up. God says, okay, it's time for the next phase of your life. Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon. Remember that name Sidon I just used a little bit ago? Who's the king there? Jezebel's father. That's interesting. And dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So first it was ravens, now it's a widow. God has prepared them to provide. Verse 10, so he arose, went to Zarephath. When he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. As she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So she said, As the Lord your God, doesn't say my God, as the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread. Only a handful of flour in a bin, a little oil in a jar, and see, I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake first and bring it to me, and afterward make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went away, did according to the word of Elijah. She and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. So now... We're looking at Elijah as Zarephath. God instructs Elijah to go to Zarephath, Gentile country, going from unclean ravens to unclean Gentiles. I mean, how in the world is God doing all of this? I'm sure Elijah had to wonder, but Elijah didn't question. He trusted God. He obeyed. We have a hard time trusting God sometimes, don't we? 
we're not sure if we really should do something or we really shouldn't do something because we're not sure we can trust what God says because God's logic is so foreign to our logic. He says if you want to become rich, become poor. If you want to become strong, become weak. We go, that doesn't make sense. Trust God. That's what we're talking about this morning. So here he goes. He goes to Zarephath. And God said he's prepared a widow. Now, obviously, you think a widow. During a drought, when there's very little food and there's no rain, a widow would be the last person on earth to have enough food to take care of Elijah. Well, it's amazing who God chooses to minister to other people. So he gets there, he walks into the city, he sees the widow, and he asks her for a drink of water. Notice she didn't even question it. He says, may I have a drink of water? And she goes to get it. Where did she get water during a drought? I don't know. The scripture doesn't tell us. But she knew where there was water, and he asked, and so she was going to go get it. Why? God had prepared her. Remember that. So she starts going after water, and he calls after her and says, Can you also bring me some food? And that got her attention. And she turns around, and she goes, The Lord your God knows I only have enough meal to cook the last meal for my son and I, and then we're going to starve to death. <laughs> I, I, different personalities react different ways. If you have the gift of mercy, I can imagine you being there and you say, give me some food, and she tells you this sad story, and your reaction probably would be, oh, I'm so sorry, I must have the wrong widow because surely God wouldn't have you fix me a meal if you're going to eat your last one and then die. Elijah didn't have that personality, but he also knew God wouldn't lead him to the wrong woman. And he said, that's okay, go fix me some food first, then you can go back and fix yourself some. Because, verse 14, the Lord God of Israel says, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor the jar of oil run dry until it rains again. If you were the widow, what would you do? I don't believe that she probably knew God. I believe from that area she probably worshiped Baal like everybody else. But God had prepared her. So she went and did what Elijah asked her to do and fixed her fixed some food for Elijah, then went back and fixed food for she and her son. And every day she fixed food for her son and her and for she and her son and over and over and over again because that's what God had prepared. Trusting God. You know, I've often said, we are so willing to trust God for our eternal life. Accept Jesus as your Savior, trust God, and he'll give you eternal life. But if when you walk out of these doors this morning, you realize you don't have any food in your house and you don't have any money in your pockets, are you willing to trust God for lunch? See, we say, well, I got food, I got money, I can buy food. Yeah, but what if you didn't? See, it's easy to say I trust God when we know what's going to happen. It's not quite so easy to trust God when we don't know what's going to happen because we have to trust God to find out. This woman trusted Elijah. Why? I don't know. First time she'd met him. 
God had prepared her. She even accepted the word of a stranger, a foreigner. So then we come to what I've entitled the tough test. Verse 17. Now it happened after these things, and we don't know how long that period of time once again or what these things were. It happened after these things that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick. And his sickness was so serious that there was no breath left in him. In other words, he was dead. Okay, a lot of people say, oh, that means something else. No, it means there's no breath in him. That means he is dead. Did you ever wonder how old the son was? Pay attention. She said to Elijah, What have I to do with you, O man of God? Have you come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? And he said to her, Give me your son. And he took, so he took him out of her arms. That must mean he wasn't that big because she was carrying him. Okay? So you can picture, I know you carry kids up until a certain age, but there's a certain age when you have to quit. He said, give me your son. So he took him out of her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on his own bed. Then he cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, have you also brought tragedy upon the widow with whom I lodge by killing her son? And he stretched himself out on the child three times, cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. Then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came back to him, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And I'm going to save the last verse just for a moment. Think about it. The son fell sick and he died. What was the woman's response? She lashed out at Elijah. She was upset. I mean, I, I did all this for you, and now my son is dead. What in the world am I going to do? She forgot how God had taken care of her, didn't she? How often do we forget what God does for us? You know, we're in a tight bind, and we pray and say, God, please help me. I need none And God provides it. And the next time we get in a bind, we go, oh, my God, oh God I need, I need, I need. We tend to forget, too. But when God works in our lives, we need to trust him. So Elijah takes the son, prays over him. Elijah's prayer, I'm going to relate back to, because I think it's very similar, to Moses' prayer out in the wilderness. Remember, Moses led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, and they were out in the wilderness, and they were kind of like us. They grumbled, and they complained, and they griped, and they... And God finally got to the point, and I'm not sure what adjective I should use to describe God, but I would use the adjective God got irritated, he got aggravated, he got, and he told Moses, he said, I'm going to wipe them all out and start over again. And Moses went to prayer and said, and he prayed, God, you can't do that because it will be a poor testimony of who you are to the Egyptians because they will laugh at you because you couldn't handle these people. That was Moses' prayer. Moses said, kill me. Don't kill the people. Elijah prayed three times. What was his prayer? He basically prayed, God, you promised this woman that they would eat until it rained again. You cannot go back on that promise. Did you notice how many times Elijah prayed? Three. And it said, and the boy revived. Does that kind of send ring bells in your brain? Jesus was dead how long? 
three days, three times, Jesus was resurrected, he was resurrected. I think there's a, you know, if you want to do a good study, do a study of scripture of how many times the number three is there. Sometimes they're not as significant as other. But God revived the boy. And then the last verse. This is the conclusion of this part of Elijah's life. And the woman said to Elijah, now remember, she had just had her son brought back to her who had been dead. He had just been raised from the dead. And the woman said, now I know. Took a lot. Now she knows. By this I know that you are a man of God. And the, uh, and the word of the Lord in your mouth is the truth. She said, I know you are a man of God and what you speak is the truth. Think about all the things that led up to that, learning to trust God. So let's just kind of review just for a couple of minutes. Look at the progress. Elijah's in front of the king making this proclamation. It won't rain until I say it's going to rain. God hid him, provided for him by the ravens. Then God sent him to Zarephath, provided for him through the widow there. God continued to provide. The next test came for the wo woman. She forgot about what God had done, and he reminded her again. All of these events, see, God works in our lives in unique ways. I taught school for years and was a school administrator for years, and so I'm very much in, and I still do teach some school, so I'm very much into that kind of a mind frame. Did you know in school, the professor, the teacher, never gives you the final exam the first day of class. He always gives it at the end of class. And what's he do in between? He gives tests and quizzes and homework. You pass some, you fail some, you're learning, and then comes the final test. That's what we see with Elijah. God is testing him in all of these ways, and Elijah is passing all of these tests. And we get to the ultimate final exam, which we don't have time to get to today, unless you want to stay until supper time, where Elijah called down fire from heaven. That was the final exam. But God knew he couldn't do it unless he went through this whole period of testing. I'm reminded of Abraham, the life of Abraham. His final exam was, take your only son Isaac and sacrifice him. Abraham obeyed, but Abraham had all these tests in between. Some he passed, some he failed. But when it came time for the final exam, he was ready. Why? He trusted God. He trusted God. So where are we today? Do we trust God? Do we realize that God's in control? Or do we panic sometimes and say, I need to do something because God doesn't seem to be taking care of this? Or are we willing to wait? Are we willing to wait until the brook dries up before we wait to hear from God if that's what he wants? Or do we see the brook drying up and we start making alternative plans? Now, I believe God expects us to use our brain and common sense and do what he asks us to do. Maybe you're here this morning and you have no clue what I'm talking about because you've never trusted God. And you say, what's all that mean? It's very simple. Christ died for you. See, we're all sinners. I don't think that takes a whole lot for us to realize that, that I'm a sinner. Just look at my last 24 hours and I realize, okay, I've done it. Recognize we're a sinner. Recognize, the scripture says, the penalty of sin is death. So I need to die to pay the price for my sins. But God sent Christ into the world to die for me, to die in my place. So if I accept him, I don't have to die. I can live. That's trusting God. 
And that's the initial step that we have to do to build that relationship with God. Some of you are here today and you've, you've been saved for years, but you've never really learned to trust God. And God's never really gotten your attention. You say, well, if God would get my attention, maybe I would trust him. I, you know, when I think about God getting people's attention, I think of Saul before he came Paul. God had to knock him off a donkey and blind him for three days, and Saul finally said, oh, well, if it takes that much to get your attention, sorry. What did he do with Moses? Moses had to spend 40 years out in the desert preparing him for the next 40 years of ministry. See, we need to learn to trust God. So, our sound theology for today is God is trustworthy. Learn to trust God. We can trust him with everything in our lives. And as Lucy said, that takes a great load off your mind. When we don't have to worry about it, we let God worry about it, it takes a great load off our mind. Danny's going to come and lead us in a song this morning. And I don't know what your need in your life is. I, if you're here this morning and you've never accepted Christ your Savior, I would ask that you come forward when we're singing and someone will be here to pray with you. Maybe you just need to come and pray for yourself and build up some of that trust and ask forgiveness for not trusting God as you should. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, thank you for who you are. Father, we need to learn to trust you. We need to be, build that relationship that we have with you in such a way that we know that we can trust even when it doesn't make sense. Father, I pray for each one here that each of us would determine in our minds and in our hearts what you would want us to do and that we would be obedient in Jesus' name. Amen.